in terms of how many people have watched Star Trek. Okay, cool. I'll try and uh, totally you just feel free to like throw up your hand if you are really confused at any point. Um, but for I'll, those who haven't seen it, phasers on stun. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I'll try and give sort of some interesting uh, tidbits about the creative, the process of creating Star Trek and that sort of thing uh, that will hopefully help give it context. Um, so um, I will start with, oh, down, okay. Um, so yeah, why should you care? Um, why should we care about what Star Trek says? Um, so over the years since it started in the 60s, we've had six series and 12 movies, uh, plus 70 million books in print, at least 120 CDs, and 40 video games. Uh, the merchandising to date is valued at $4 billion. And there's conventions and fan associations worldwide. So I'm going to a convention in a week and a half in Star Trek Las Vegas and also talking about this sort of topic. Um, but there are conventions almost all over the world. Um, and uh, it really has sort of, I think, touched a chord. There's new generations of Trekkies being raised by their parents who are Trekkies. Um, and I think part of that has to do with the utopian, humanist, secular vision of the future that it largely presents. Um, then also in terms of what it says, so science fiction and particularly utopian visions like Star Trek, they inspire our thinking about the future. They show us what is it possible for humans to achieve. And so we need to ask, is that, do we think that's, it's enough? That do we think that it, it that the access to opportunity in that vision is limited for some people, or is it truly representing a diverse future where everyone gets a shot at being the captain or fulfilling a, a role in society? Many episodes, um, as you mentioned, Roddenberry, who I'll talk a little bit about, about in a second, really wanted this to be, to share a message. And so many episodes talk about a message about human rights. Um, there's episodes that address um, AIDS, um, same-sex rights, disability. Um, there's a lot of episodes, as I'll talk about later, that um, talk about um, the importance of uh, collaboratively working together, um, thinking rationally, and challenging false gods. Um, so yeah, so we just have to ask what messages are being sent, and is anyone being left out? Um, so my process when I'm looking at the episodes is I have certain a whole bunch of questions that I ask, and um, I think that they're largely applicable to when you're really consuming any media. Um, I think it's important that we're always questioning the messages that we're consuming in pop culture. Um, so I started with who are the main characters? What demographics? Uh, do they represent? Um, are they fulfilling stereotypical roles for the race, gender, etc.? Um, are there people, for example, um, who fulfill? Um, I'll actually, sorry, get to that in a second one. So, um, how much power do they have? So, again, like our until Voyager, which came out in 1995, I think, um, <laughs> around mid 90s. Um, there was never a woman captain. It took them until the third series to get a woman first officer. Um, there were very few characters of color. What ones that were there were important and they represented something, but how much power do they have in terms of the structure, in terms of their relationships with other people, um, in terms of society in general and the command on the ship? Um, how diverse are the background characters? This is actually something really interesting that's sort of come out in the last couple of years um, since there was a 2009 reboot movie where they sort of recreated the original series characters. And people brought up that the whole time in Star Trek since the 60s, there had never been um, gay characters in the background. Like you could see men and women on dates a lot of times, but there had never been even like a same-sex couple holding hands in the background. And um, the response from the people who were working on the movies were basically, oh, it's because um, this was actually Gene Roddenberry's son, who's now sort of in charge of the rights to the franchise, and he said that um, it's because in the 23rd century, you don't have to let your rainbow flags fly because everyone's equal. But <laughs> the thing is, like, you're, like I said, you're seeing straight people have relationships in the background, but you don't ever see gay people doing it. Like That's not letting your rainbow flag fly, that's just representing reality. <laughs> um, do any 
tropes show up repeatedly in plot lines or characters. So um, tropes are not always necessarily bad. They're um, plot devices, basically. Um, but some of them, so basically, it's sort of like, yeah, I heard, what's a trope? Um, what so, is a trope? Yeah. yes, put up your hand if I'm using terms you don't um, know. So um, it's basically a, um, a plot device that through its use in culture, we have a, um, a, a sense of recognition of. So the damsel in distress is a common trope that we would you know, see, like the woman in the tower and the knight in shining armor is another trope. Um, the, um, the black widow, um, like characters that fill roles that we understand in our, our cultural imagination. Sorry? Cliches. Yeah, um, yeah, it can be. And actually, Star Trek has basically invented tropes that are now used by other people. Um, for example, the green skinned space babe, um, who uh, we see in the original series, there is um, a breed called the Orions, and they have these green skinned space girls that dance in very scantily clad outfits, and um, at that point in the series, basically enjoy being exploited, so not super feminist there. Um, later, they sort of add some more nuance to that, but um, the idea of the green skin space babe is that no matter how weird your alien species is, the women have to be attractive enough to be sexually appealing to a straight male audience today. Um, so, um, and yeah, I mean, you see this all through Star Trek and other sci-fi series since that, you know, you make these weird aliens, but they have to have ginormous breasts. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously that's something that as a feminist, I would challenge that idea, but. Um, and then the Jacqueline in Distress is another one, which it shows up more in the old series and kind of gets a bit better later on. Um, she always does. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, or, I mean, there's, yeah, so there's a bunch of them, and they aren't always bad, like I said, but if they show up repeatedly in main characters and they're using them sort of as a crutch, then it's something to be aware of, and it tells you something about the creators, I think. Um, who is the intended audience, and how does this impact the content? So like I said, um, like, what assumptions are the creators making about who's watching this? and what they care about. So in Star Trek Voyager, about halfway through, which again, this was happening in the 90s to early 2000s, um, they were like, oh, we have to bring on a sexy Borg and that this will attract young male viewers. So there's an assumption there about like our, the target market should be young male viewers. What they want is they want to see women in revealing clothing. Um, so just questioning those types of things. Who are they trying to appeal to? How are they doing it? And what does this say about what we think about that? population. And then who created the show and why? And I'll get a little bit more into that. And then um, I also look at some more questions that are sort of specific to Star Trek, um, or at least I think are more relevant for the analysis. So one is what are the guiding principles and messages, and I'll sort of outline a couple of those. Um, are there cultures or characters acting as stand-ins for human groups? And this is something that we see quite a bit, where um, they'll have, uh, like there's arguments that some of the things that they imagine, it's not surprising for humans, but they're drawing from stereotypes from human cultures. Um, so for example, there's an argument that, um, well, there's been arguments over various periods of time that like the Klingons were meant to re represent a certain race of people. Um, and earlier it was that they were supposed to represent the Russians, but then later it was, are they supposed to represent black people because they're all acted by black people mostly in the earlier series. So there's been arguments around that. There are actually also episodes, one of which I'll talk about later, where they've cast an entire alien race out of black people and then had them wear like tribal prints and that makes them aliens. So a lot of sort of problematic stuff around there. Um, but then there's also, I think what is a, or could be seen as positive examples of it where they will have, um, there's an episode of The Next Generation which was in the 80s and 90s um, and arguably the most humanist of the series where um, there's a species or a group of an aliens that are um, androgynous, and one of the aliens realizes that she 
is a female. And it's supposed to be an allegory for how we think about gay people. So she has a big speech about, you know, I'm not sick, I don't need to be cured, I was born this way. Um, and it's a really effective way of getting a message across. Um, but it's also potentially a bit of an issue, so I'll talk a bit more about that as well. Um, as I said earlier, I asked, what does the show tell us we can achieve about humanity? And are the possibilities limited for anyone? And what aspects of today's society do the creators think are going to be gone? And what elements do they think are going to persist? Um, so as I've been watching these episodes, I've noticed a lot of cases, um, for example, where um, people will sort of make like, uh, there's an episode of Voyager, which is set in the 24th century, where one of the characters is making jokes about one of the other characters being a Native American. So he's saying like, um, oh, like did your spirit guide tell you that kind of stuff. And the fact that like they think that we're still gonna have racist, racist jokes in the 24th century, I think is kind of problematic. Um, but then, you know, what things do they think will be gone? They think like we won't be using currency anymore, that poverty is gonna be eliminated. So all of that's important to look at as well. <laughs> I'm causing a buzzing somewhere. Um, so, my pages are ah, they're double sided, that's why. Okay, so um, as Ian mentioned, Gene Roddenberry, who was the creator of Star Trek, was a pretty big humanist. He was um, originally raised Baptist, but he rejected church teachings as a teen. And it seems to be when I move closer that way. Okay. Um, as an adult, he uh, joined the American Humanist Association. And um, he, um, throughout, so this, when he joined the, the association, it was actually after <coughs> the original series had um, ended, and I think just before Next Generation started. Um, but he said that through the whole time of the original series, he had been fighting um, decisions like the producers wanted to give Spock, who's a Vulcan, a Christian funeral. And uh, so he's like, he's like, no, that makes no sense at all. Um, so he he You're fought sort of the Vulcan star. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So he said like he fought the the creators that wanted to bring in sort of uh, Judeo-Christian uh, religious templates. Although it's interesting because actually Leonard Nimoy, who plays Bob, was Jewish and took the the live long and prosper sign from Jewish religious uh, ceremonies. Um, so. Um, Actually, it's a secret sign. Yeah, yeah. Until you said that, I didn't. But yes, when I went to Hebrew elementary school, and actually we, we well, we weren't taught that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. He said um, that he was at a, a, a Hebrew um, or Jewish ceremony, and that he wasn't supposed to look. And he looked up, and he saw the rabbi making the symbol, and then he took that for the Vulcan <laughs> symbol for live long and prosper. It's, it's the first initial of God in Hebrew. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's some interesting kind of crossovers, I guess, and um, resistance, but then also borrowing from. Um, uh, also, there's actually a lot of references in the original series to like a new Adam and Eve. There's um, quite a few references to like biblical um, uh, like stories. Tropes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sort of like tropes. Yes, <laughs> um, and uh, it's interesting. I don't like. I don't think that it's. I think it's more that it's a technique because it's something that most of us know as part of our culture, even if we don't believe it. But um, and it's also a little bit of a challenge to it, the fact that you know there could be a new Adam and Eve that would be aliens on this planet um, and nothing really to do with God. Um, so I have a quote here where he said, um, "This was in an interview in uh, the '80s that I condemn the effort to take away the power of rational decision, to drain free will, and a hell of a lot of money in the bargain. Religions vary in their degree of idiocy, but I reject them all." <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so uh, he tends to be portrayed, I think, partly because you know he passed away partway through the next generation. So he tends to be portrayed as as a bit of an icon. Um, his nickname's Great Bird of the Galaxy, um, and. Uh, there's sort of, I think, a, a narrative that everything progressive about Star Trek was about him and that everything that wasn't was the producers forcing him into something that's more palatable for the time. I don't think that's entirely true, um, but uh, definitely he had some pretty neat um, ideas that were 
pretty impressive coming out in mainstream TV in the 60s. So another quote um, is, uh, Star Trek is my statement to the world. Understand that Star Trek is more than just my political philosophy, it is my social philosophy, my racial philosophy, my overview on life and the human condition. Um, so what we see, um, especially during the episodes that he actually had a hand in writing in up until he died in 1991, um, he actually had a pretty big hand in that vision. So what are those visions? Oh, hit the microphone with the paper. Um, so some of the principles that we see in Star Trek, um, and they vary in the degree that they're emphasized, but um, one of the ones that most Star Trek fans will be familiar with is the Prime Directive, uh, which is basically a statement of non-interference in cultures that are not as an, as an advanced degree of technology. Um, so it's a bit of an attack on um, colonialism and the idea that um, you know because we um, think of ourselves as more advanced that we have the right to tell other people what to do with their own development. Um, so kind of neat. Um, it gets violated all the time and then there's a big sort of ethical question about it, but um, that's one of the important um, principles we see. Um, another one is strength and diversity and cooperation, uh, and that everyone's a member of the team, they all have their own unique things they bring to the table. A lot of times, though, they're able to cross over into each other's roles and show they're really competent in a range of areas. Um, they're... Um, Next, that human beings can solve problems peacefully with critical thinking, and we don't need supernatural help. Um, as a matter of fact, lots of times they encounter an all-powerful being that seems like, um, or that some people consider a god, and they basically figure out that it's some sort of powerful alien. And <laughs> um, yeah, so it's kind of cool. It's me. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> um, so um, there's, um, I think, a quote that really defines the. Um, the raison d'etre for Star Trek or Star Fleet officers because apparently we, it's never really clear they aren't supposed to have money and there's episodes where they refer to them not having money but then in later series they are buying things so it's not really clear how that happens but um, so what are they doing if they're not doing it for money um, in the first episode of Deep Space Nine the captain says it is the unknown that defines our existence we are constantly searching not just for answers to our questions but for new questions we are explorers um, I think, yeah, that really defines what they're there to do. Um, they're basically taking classic principles, or uh, not like classical, but I mean, these are, it's not like principles that you have reinvented, but um, that it's expressed in a new way and uh, in a sort of a coherent utopian vision. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the issue of women in diversity and what Gene Roddenberry thought about that. So um, I have a couple different questions from him. Um, the first one is, I tend to think in the future it won't seem at all strange that women are treated as equals of men. And if we don't have blacks and whites working together when our civilization reaches that time frame, there won't be any people. So that was why he was so committed to having women and people of color um, in all of the series. Um, but um, it also was a bit, um, where was it? Um, I'll actually, yeah, I'll talk about that on the next slide. So um, I think he really was committed to that, and um, there's examples about how in the, the pilot of the original series, the first officer was a woman, and all the women wore pants, and then basically the studio sent it back and was like, we have a lot of problems with this, and part of it is that you can't have a woman that high up. And uh, so they basically put them all in short skirts, and they got rid of the woman first officer, um, who later became his wife. And um, the, um, but on the plus side, they also didn't have any characters of color in the pilot, so they brought in um, George Takeya Sulu, the navigator, um, who um, his had actually been like in the Japanese internment camp as a child, and uh, now is sort of an internet gay celebrity um, and pretty cool dude. Um, and then uh, Michelle Nichols as the uh, communications officer uh, Uhura, 
so I'll talk a bit more about her later. Um, but it's also, it's a bit conflicting. I don't think you can say that he was, um, that by today's standards, you wouldn't have issues with how he related to women and women characters. Um, you know, he talks about later in his life how he felt that the studios made him do dishonest, like write dishonest writing of women characters, that he oversimplified them. Um, but there's a quote from his wife where he says, it was just part of the fun. Do you love to have beautiful women around and love to have beautiful women with no clothes or as few clothes as he could possibly put them in? <laughs> and uh, another producer says, Gene had an eye for the ladies. It didn't matter what it was, a story conference, cutting a film, the daily rushes, whatever. He would stop and he would immediately proceed to make it better. And by making it better, one means making it more revealing. But so like he would just run out of anything to go into like a women's costume fitting and like cut parts of the cloth off it. Um, so um, you know, it's questionable how much he was really committed to the pants thing. Um, but it's, it's interesting. I mean, I still think it was pretty groundbreaking for the time. So um, some general trends that I've identified. Um, the seems like the diversity of the, the representations of women characters and people of color really improves over the first four series, and then I think declines um, over the, oh, I did, I'm not counting the animated series. So the first five series <laughs> declines over the sixth series and the new movies. Um, and that's not just numbers, but also the types of roles that they're allowed to play. Um, so in the original series, um, you have basically um, one woman character, and she gets um, not a lot of time, but when she does get time, it's really cool. Um, and then in Next Generation, you have two main women characters. They're both, oh, three briefly, and then one dies. <laughs> so the other two are left in caring professions. There's the doctor and the counselor, and there's nothing wrong with that, but when that's the only role that women get to have, then it's potentially an issue. Um, in the next two series, you get just more com complex roles, um, non-traditional roles, a combination of um, traditional and non-traditional roles. Um, and then it kind of goes back to retro sexism. So um, the other thing is, um, I mentioned the alien allegories, like using aliens as a stand-in to represent gay people or um, people with disabilities. And um, even though that can be a really effective way of telling a story, it doesn't really translate into how the main characters um, relate to each other. So even though we get this thing where there's aliens who are supposed to represent gay people, we never see gay people on the show. So they have um, basically like diverse representation without context, and uh, then episodes that try to give context to aliens but don't actually show that humans embody that in their own lives. Um, so same with, um, actually that's the main one is the one with gay people, but um, they have you know other episodes where they are dealing with um, sort of, um, uh, like there's a disability episode in Space Nine um, where they have an alien who comes and has to use a wheelchair because it's low gravity on her planet, but then you, other than Next Generation, with a blind character. There's not really any other analysis of disability. So um, if you just kind of have this one-off, it's really hard to adequately represent a diverse group, like people with disabilities, or gay people, or black people. Um, so having like a one-off episode where you have aliens um, is, like I said, a good story, but it doesn't actually, I think, really do the issue justice. OK, so I'm just going to stop for a second and see if anyone is totally lost or if anyone has any questions. Yes. I have a question that is common. When you were talking about disabilities and things, uh, it occurred to me I never saw a fat character. That is also true. Yes. Um, a very good point. Um, they really don't have characters that are like non-traditional or like non-conventional tiny body shapes. I actually found this out because I had a friend sew me a costume for the Vegas convention because they're trying to break a Guinness record for the most fans in costume. And the patterns, like the largest pattern size was like barely fit me. Um, so um, it was kind of interesting. And yeah, I mean, that's all, I mean, I guess they would probably argue and I don't think it's fair, which is the same thing they argue with um, disability is that, well, it's the 21st century, so it wouldn't exist. Um, but that's a problem. It's like your vision of perfection is able-bodied, skinny people. Yeah. 
was there a guy in a box uh, next captain? Yeah, there was. Um, well, I think it was actually an episode. So in the um, original series, um, the captain who was in the the pilot, they kicked him out um, as, as one of the changes that was made before the series. And then later he comes back and he's in uh, like a sort of iron lung slash wheelchair. Um, so that was pretty cool. And then actually in the movies, they brought him back, I believe, briefly in a wheelchair, but I may be wrong. Um, I only saw it once, so um, yes, yeah, so there were a couple, and there, but there were there was also an episode that I think was really bad um, in Next Generation where Worf breaks his back and then contemplates suicide because he's no longer worth like it's not not worth living, and everyone has to try and convince him it's worth living, but it's still um, the person who wrote the episode for Deep Space Nine was a person who used a wheelchair, and he said like I saw that episode and it just made me furious that they would be even talking like that in the 24th century. And so I had to write an episode where the person was confronted with, like a person with a disability was confronted with the ability to be cured and then rejected it because it was a part of who they were. Um, so that's what they did um, in Deep Space Nine, but it's a bit Actually, of a that brings up, when you were saying that, I was thinking the person was suffering from depression, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mental illness is not mentioned. Yeah, when it does come up, um, I mean, I think there, there's actually one episode I'll talk about a bit later that is, um, they, they sort of challenge some ideas of what we think of as crazy ideas that we would think of a person as crazy for having, but you're right, there isn't really a lot of, at least not what we would think of as like modern um, critical analysis of mental illness. There's you know people who get possessed by things that make them appear to have mental illness, but that it's always like they're seriously ill and they need to be cured or they are possessed by an alien virus or something um, that like there's and then it often actually turns into kind of like sexism as well because a lot of times like in uh, the next generation the counselor gets um, this guy sort of preys on her energy and she becomes like a crazy um, seductress catty woman who's also rapidly aging and <laughs> therefore no longer desirable and actually that it leads me into a really good so I'm going to talk about my three least favorite moments in the entire Star Trek franchise, and then um, my four sort of what I think of as highlights, and it was really hard to choose those ones, but um, so this episode really goes well into the whole in the aging thing, because they don't really present aging very nicely on Star Trek as well. Um, it's hard because in the original series, like obviously it's the 60s, so you have to give it some a little bit of slack for what it was, but um, it also led to everything after that. And this episode is just so bad, <laughs> um, but also kind of hilarious. So basically, it's called Mud's Women, and um, the plot is that they are chasing this guy who is um, trafficking in mail order brides. And uh, the three women there on the left are the mail order brides, and when they get on the ship, literally the men cannot speak. Like they look at them and they're all just stunned <laughs> because they're so gorgeous. And this actually happens a few times. It's going like, what on earth are we supposed to think that like, it does really play in that, into that idea of you can't have too many women around because it'll just distract the men. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they have their like awesome little like sort of fringy sequins and, um, and uh, they, uh, so, that, but it turns out that he's a con artist because they're secretly ugly <laughs> and they're taking a pill that makes them beautiful. So it, um, it yeah, I know, I was really going, are you like a head explosion moment? Um, so um, there's a part, like for the beginning part, they're arguing, um, you know, just, oh, let us go find these, these lonely men on colonies because we just really need to be wives to people. And, um, and then uh, that, partway through they turn like their beauty charms start wearing off and they look like the women on the side who are like that's like me in the bathroom in the morning like that's not that bad I hope <laughs> um, but you're supposed to think that they are hideous um, and like they actually say one of them like when they look like that one of them goes um, like I'm going back to who I was unclean and the next person goes I can't stand myself like this. Um, and uh, the main woman in this one is Eve the Blonde One. 
<laughs> yeah, it's um, it gets better, but these these are like particularly low points. Um, so she has some quotes in this. So this is the beginning where she's arguing he should just let them go and, and marry these lonely male colonists. It's the same story for all of us, Captain. No men. We've got men waiting to be our husbands for us, and you're taking us in the opposite direction, staring at us like we're Saturnus harem girls or something. Um, and uh, so, uh, and then later, she they um, go to this planet where there's these miners, and the miners want the women. But then, as soon as they start turning back, the miners are like, "We've been duped." And Kirk says, "Oh, you can have your money back because you've been defrauded because they're secretly ugly." Um, I'm pretty like I'd love to see if we actually had like a marriage law where it was like, "Oh yeah, but if they turn out to like, you know, get disfigured or something." Or, I mean, Obviously, we have no fault of horse, but if we had fault of horse, I would like if that was a fault. Uh, it's like so unrealistic. People get older and then they look less <laughs> conventionally attractive. That is a fact. So, um, and they are still attractive. So, anyway, ageist and sexist. And then um, when the guy starts to reject her because she's basically like he basically just wanted her for sex. Um, she goes, is this the kind of wife you want, Ben? Not someone to help you. Not a wife to cook and sew and cry and knead. But this kind, selfish, vain, useless. <laughs> and, uh, and then, like, it's so confusing because then the end, um, Kirk comes down to the planet and he brings the pills so that she can look beautiful again. But they're placebos, and she looks beautiful again anyway. So there's this kind of weird message that all you really needed was confidence. But then it like doesn't make any sense because they turn back and forth from being beautiful to ugly, and it's like even then it's like the whole purpose is to get a guy to want to marry you so you can help him clean his pots. Um, okay, so that is definitely my second least favorite episode. <laughs> um, least favorite episode, and actually this was, there was a little bit, in Next Generation, gets a lot better after the first couple of seasons, but in the first season they tried to sort of rip off a lot of original series plot lines, and um, there were two episodes that were really bad, and it was hard to choose. Um, one of them is where um, they go to a planet that's a matriarchy, and um, they uh, there's a group of guys um, who have been stranded on the planet and exiled because they had ideas that they should have power. And it's supposed to be inverting sexism and turning it on its head and letting people see it wouldn't be fair, but instead, like, the women just come off as totally crazy and the message is just, like, don't ever let women be in charge of anything. Um, but the episode that I chose instead was Code of Honor because it is sexist and racist. Um, it, uh, so this is the one I was talking about where the aliens are entirely played by African Americans and it was, um, there was no reason for this in the script and there were some people who objected to it after the fact um, that, and actually the director supposedly got fired halfway through. Um, and they embody the worst sort of out of Africa, heart of darkness stereotypes that you would think of. They're, um, they're really driven on um, greed. They, um, they're, the women are not allowed to own any property or sorry, the women own the property, but they, are, they don't have any decision-making rights, and the property is um, stewarded by their husbands. Um, the, and then the leader abducts the next generation security chief, who's a woman who they all point out is very attractive in this episode, which I think we can tell, um, and uh, makes her fight a death match with his wife because he wants to inherit his wife's money and screw the security chief. Um, I'm really not making people who haven't seen this like it, but we'll get to the good stuff. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, but and the only thing that makes them like discernible from just like a horrible racist stereotype is that their tribal prints are shiny. Um, and um, there's also some offhanded or an offhanded comment where um, to like a, a, what they say is like, oh, there's an ancient Native American practice where they would abduct women as an insult to uh, their other tribal leaders. So again, like just really like now we know you don't, or you would hope you would know, don't just like throw out out of context generalizations about whole cultures of people um, that like the actual practice they're referencing was used by like one tribe and it's a lot more complex than one sentence can embody. So uh, definitely some problems in this one. There's also um, a part where 
the counselor comes down to talk to the security chief in front of the captain and basically gets her to confess um, that she's attracted to the warlord for no reason. Um, just so she says, but, but it was a thrill. Lutan is such a basic male image and having him say he wants you and the security chief goes, yes, of course it made me feel good when he, wait a minute, you tricked me. And like, there's absolutely no reason to get someone to confess that in front of the captain except for, for gossip. So um, it, uh, yeah, really did not like that episode either. Last, last low point, and then we'll get to the good stuff. Uh, the Alice Eve underwear scene in the most recent movie. So, um, in the most recent Star Trek reboot movie, um, they brought back this character who, uh, in the original series, is a scientist, and she's a weapons specialist in the movie. And um, she doesn't really get a lot of screen time, but one of her shots is this lovely shot where she she's turned around and she says like, oh, don't watch me, I'm getting changed. But then Kirk turns around anyway and sees her in her underwear and she's like, what's going on? But it has absolutely no purpose in the plot. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, I, I mean, um, I'm not necessarily opposed to things when they have a purpose, but um, like when there's no reason for the character. Um, and then in the movie, both the women characters are romantically tied to the male characters. There's only two of them in the whole movie that get to talk. Um, there, um, there's an initial conference that they have of all the important people of, in Starfleet, and there's no women at the table of about like 25 guys, um, mostly white people. Um, and it's like I said, it's basically pandering to what they assume are the interests of young male viewers. And then there was a bit of controversy after. Um, which I don't think you can probably see that. So um, the creators who um, made the movie got kind of called out on this, and um, two of them sort of half apologized and then doubled down on it and said basically, well, it's okay because Kirk was shirtless at the beginning because he's in bed with two half-naked cat women. <laughs> um, but, um, and then, oh, and we had another scene with one of the male characters in a shower, but it got deleted, and so it's okay because we equally objectified men. Well, I don't really want things to be like just as bad for men as it is for women. <laughs> um, I don't think it's a particularly great argument. Um, but also, it's um, it's a false equivalence because men in our society are not objectified in the same way as women. Um, I, like I said, I don't think it would be good if they were. But um, that um, so a study that came out in the European Journal of Social Psychology last year showed that men and women both um, look at women as parts and look at men as wholes, and that they were better at identifying parts of women's bodies and remembering which women women they were part of than men. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and then there's been numerous studies that back up the effect of like reading magazines and then taking a math test on women versus men, it doesn't really do much too. Um, so, like I said, I don't think it would be good, but the fact is there's uh, like a body of evidence to show that we already look at women in different ways, largely or at least partly because of what we see in the media, and then that that has negative impacts on how women are able to perform in society. So I don't think it's okay to just be like, oh, well, we had some guys without their shirts on. Also, the fact that he walks in on her and she says, don't look, and then she looks, so it's gross. <laughs> um, yes, okay. So, good stuff. So, I think that possibly one of the best moves in Star Trek was casting Michelle Nichols as you were in the original series. Um, like I said, this was the 60s, and um, it had a really big impact on a lot of people. Um, she, um, yes, yes, exactly, I will tell that story. So um, what, I, what you were saying, so um, later in the next series, Whoopi Goldberg plays sort of a wise bartender, and uh, she said that part of what she went and asked for G. Roddenberry for the role, because when she was little, she was watching TV, and she saw the original series, and uh, um, she went running to her mom and said, Mom, you got to see this. There's a black woman on TV and she ain't no maid. Um, <laughs> so some people criticized that she was basically, in a lot of episodes, sort of like a glorified telephone operator. Um, she's the first thing to say, hailing frequencies open, sir. Um, and, and I think, you know, near the end, she actually said, you know, if I have to say that line one more time, I'm going to smash this console. Um, but she did have, like, 
a few chances to show that she was more than just that. She, there's one episode where the, the computer breaks down and she's the only one who can get in there and repair the console and they, they have her in like coveralls and everything so she didn't always have to be in a little, little skirt. Um, and then in, in the movies, she's just really a part of the team. And uh, there's, so I think that, she, yeah, she was really important for the time. Also, um, she was going to leave the show after the first series and she was going to start a Broadway career and she was out at a restaurant and uh, the waiter came and said, like, one of your fans wants to meet you. And uh, she turns around and it's Martin Luther King Jr. And um, he says, basically, I can't tell you um, like how much we're fans of yours. It's the only show that, that I let my, my kids stay up late and watch. And uh, she said, oh, well, thank you. I'm going to really miss my cast. And he said, no, you can't leave. What are you talking about? And uh, that this is so important to what we're doing, that it's breathing life into our struggle for equality to show that this man has seen the future and there will be black people there on the bridge, that your rank means you're fourth in command of this ship. And that's just incredible for what we're doing now. So, um, so I think that was pretty cool. Um, Whoa, okay. Um, confronting false gods, I think, um, is there's quite a few moments where this happens, but um, I think that it is an important message that basically no powerful, no matter how powerful someone is, that humans can stand up and they and like speak their mind and show that um, we have value as rational, cooperative beings, um, and that humanity. Um, in a lot of these cases, the, so there's these all-powerful beings. There's one, um, these are only a, a couple of examples, but in the original series, there's um, one who's like a giant all-powerful child named the Squire of Gothos, and he um, dresses up in Napoleonic clothing and makes them all like dance for him and things, and then it turns out that his parents are all powerful beings and they kind of they were like oh stop doing that you can't play with those toys and um they're like oh we're sorry guys that he shouldn't have been doing this at all with his power um so there's like he's definitely not a god he's an alien and he's his parents are enlightened and want to keep him out of screwing around with other little people um then there's one where um they find the greek gods and it turns out the greek gods were actually a bunch of aliens who uh, came to Earth and people saw them and wrote a whole mythology on them. And uh, but there's one who's Apollo who actually believes that he is a god. And the whole episode is about saying like, there's it's not worth being in a society where you're all powerful and in charge of all of us. Um, and then in Next Generation, there's Q, um, who I think we're talking about. Um, and uh, he shows up more than any of the other ones and is kind of a fan favorite. Um, and I mean, I guess it is probably a bit of an issue that I don't remember. I may be wrong, but I don't remember any time when like the big god's a woman. But um, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's an issue. Maybe it's. Oh, there was one in Next Generation. Oh, was it? Um, and she. The devil one. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's one where there's one where the devil is a woman. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so even though I think um, you know, Q is also they obviously see as an alien, and later in the series. Um, you can learn more about like the Q culture and uh, like how they appropriate and things. So it definitely makes it clear that even though he can snap his fingers and change your clothes and transport you across the room and across the galaxy, that um, it's not something we need to be confused about um, or scared about or developing um, illogical beliefs about. Um, and he tests the crew, and then the crew basically proves themselves through showing they can be rational, compassionate work together, um, that they can exhibit uh, strong reasoning. Um, so I think that that is, um, is a good message. Oh, and um, I actually watched this episode just this week, and or again. Oh, wait, oh, right, I had this. I don't, you probably can't read this, but there's Q saying, let us pray for understanding and for compassion. And the goes, let us do no such damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I actually think um, that there's a Beach Day Sign episode called Far Beyond the Stars that I think is probably one of the best episodes ever. And um, like I said, it was really hard to pick because there's a lot. Um, but 
like it, um, there's a lot of episodes that like I said, have a message, and I think it's great, they're great stories, um, but often they get accused of being too heavy-handed, and I think that it's kind of fair to be heavy-handed when the issues are so important, and especially the ones in the 60s where people were really encouraged not to talk about them, and there was a, um, a strong sense of um, that the way to deal with racism was to be colorblind, and that we just shouldn't mention race. Um, so what you ended up with was, like I said, a lot of diversity without context. And I think that Far Beyond the Star has really tried to give context to the diversity that we see in Deep Space Nine with the first black captain. So um, basically, um, it's a story where the um, captain starts having visions that aren't really ever explained. Uh, like, he has some sort of medical thing. He's in sick bay, he's being treated. And the vision that he has is that he's um, a 1950s science fiction writer writing for a magazine um, that's sort of like um, uh, Amazing Tales or Galaxy. And uh, so it's, it's got a bit of an homage to early science fiction. Um, but the problem is that he can't get his stories published because he wants to write about a black captain who is the captain of Deep Space Nine. And uh, all of the characters in the show play characters in this vision, um, and it gives them just a really neat chance to sort of stretch their um, definitions of who they were till that point. So you got this uh, the room there, and uh, he's there, and there's also um, a woman writer who is going by uh, K, KL something or other instead of using her real name so that people don't know that she's a woman. Um, so it starts out with the um, editor coming in and saying, you know, they want to do a picture of you, but you know, the black guy and the woman have to stay home that day um, because no one can know that you write for us. And uh, he starts having this vision of Deep Space Nine and what the future could be like with a black man in charge. And um, so over the course of the show, people, he's so unwilling to um, accept that they won't publish his story that people start to think you're crazy for believing this. And um, he, um, so then also he, um, ha it, it talks a bit about uh, like police violence against um, African Americans. So he has, um, the guy who plays his son on the show plays this sort of petty thief who's uh, shot by police because he was breaking into a car and he had a crowbar. And uh, the writer guy confronts the police and is like, why did you shoot him? And they basically beat the hell out of him. And um, it's really moving today because we still see this. Um, so um, what they said about um, the episode is, um, oh. uh, so first of all, um, one of the producers said that Iris Stephen Bear, another producer, and I discussed the possibility of Avery, who's the guy who plays the captain, directing, knowing that he was going to be in every frame. We don't like that combination because it's hard to direct yourself. However, this was a story about racism and prejudice, and we felt very strongly that it would be wrong if it came from a bunch of people who didn't necessarily know about that experience. We knew that it was imperative to the story and imperative to the integrity of television for it to be done right. And um, a lot of, um, I think that's pretty significant because there's a lot of examples of before where they were saying like, we're a bunch of straight white guys, but we can totally write about women's equality without talking to any women because it's just like we can figure this out. But the, later they tried a bit harder to get people who had actually had those experiences come and write scenes that, um, and I think you can see that come out in the way that they're written. And then Avery Brooks, who's the director, said, you know, if we change the people's clothes, this story could be about right now. What's insidious about racism is that it's, it is unconscious. Um, and then one of the other actors said, Star Trek at its best deals with social issues. And though you could say, well, that was prejudice in the 50s, the truth of the matter is here we are in the 21st century and it's still there. And that's what we have to be reminded by and that's what this episode does terrifically well. And I agree, so. <laughs> um, Captain Daneway, I'm, I'm winding up. I got my last highlight and then we'll open it for, for discussion. So, um, the captain of the, the Starship Voyager. Uh, she's highly capable. Um, she um, is 
a really big science geek, which I think is awesome. Um, actually, farther, the farther you get in the series, the more they have women in science roles, which is important when part of the um, discrepancy we see in women pursuing those um, STEM careers is a lack of seeing that you can and that there are women who do this. Um, and uh, she's one of the more hands-on captains. That there's um, in the original series, there's an episode where there's no one left on the bridge, and Kirk doesn't know what to do. Like he's literally just wandering around, being like, "I can't do anything without people." And uh, you know, but Captain Janeway would be like in there working the consoles, and she knows all the systems. Um, she has these really neat collaborations with the crew. She's also really one of the. She's probably the captain that's most supportive of critical thinking by her crew, and the most able to bring together diverse people to work towards a common goal. So there's a season early on where her engineer, um, a scene where her engineer um, is questioning her, and she says that, um, basically, that I want you to question me, I appreciate that. And um, that, I think, is, is positive. So um, she's pretty cool. And um, but she kind of gets like a lot of hate from Star Trek fan community. So I went in and I was reading, you know, why do people not like Jane And I found that a lot of it was really, um, if not like, I don't think it was consciously sexist, but it was definitely had critiques that you wouldn't say the same thing about a guy. So for example, Picard worked so brilliantly because he subverted the traditional Captain Kirk alpha male stereotype, but a female Picard, well, she mostly just plays into them. So you can't be someone who's collaborative and consultative without playing into female stereotypes. And what they needed was a take charge, dynamic female captain. What they gave us was a moralizing, overly liberal pushover, all too willing to throw her like crew's life away for no reason at all if it made her seem superior, and at least as interested in prancing around in frilly dresses on the holodeck as she is at leading her crew. Um, yeah, okay, I don't think she does it that much, but also the whole, it's the idea again that like we can't think of leadership without it being masculine, so if a woman leader has a feminine side and likes to occasionally wear a frilly dress in the holodeck that's like undermining of her ability to see them as a leader. Um, and then a couple more quotes that I got off some forums. Um, Easily Janeway is the worst. That was, who the F loses a starship on a shakedown cruise? A woman, that's who. <laughs> that damn school marm hairdo of her just drove me crazy. I understand there's a certain talent for looking like you're always in command of the situation, but whereas Picard and Kirk pulled that off perfectly, Jane just seemed like she was arrogant. And I remember one friend saying they couldn't stand her voice. Another friend seemed like said she seemed like she knew too much about science. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, so you know, this isn't like a scientific survey, but I just definitely identified those trends there about like the people who didn't like Jane Lance that often were citing things about um, she was too bossy and bitchy, or she was too weak and feminine, or she was, um, her hair was annoying, her voice was annoying. There was a lot of accusations that she was inconsistent, um, and then people would say, oh, that's not sexist, because I'm just saying she's inconsistent. But the other captains all have moments like, and times like that. I mean, Kirk is all over the place. <laughs> um, Picard is super grumpy for two or three seasons, and then gets to be like kind of an awesome, uh, more, I guess, well, not a grumpy kind of right? Mm -hmm. He's like, I, he likes everyone, he's more friends with people. Um, so I don't necessarily think it's an equal critique. I don't, I think it's fair, but then you should also say the things about the It's that the same the thing as the racism, it's unconscious. Sexism. Yeah, and also, a lot of people who defended her said, oh no, Janeway's awesome, she had balls. So, uh, <laughs> over and over again, they say, oh yeah, Jamie had more balls than the card. And it's, so it's like, what makes someone a leader is that they have balls, so they're like manly. Um, oh wait, did I even have anything? Oh, but, but good stuff. Um, okay, so like I said, she's a complex character. She executes the position of authority with capability and compassion. She, uh, her ability to command based on her gender never comes into question by her crew. It's questioned like twice by other aliens and it's made clear that those aliens are like horrible sort of backward uh, groups of people. And um, she, uh, she strikes, so she, I think she actually is successful. I think she strikes the balance. She doesn't have to be like overly 
uh, masculine to succeed, um, but she also doesn't embody a female stereotype, in my view. Um, and she's hands-on and she's a science geek. The only thing, I, I wouldn't say she's the best written or most complex woman character in, ever in Star Trek, um, just because she does really take on sort of a, a maternal role, which nothing wrong with that, um, but it means that she has issues with, um, she doesn't really get to have like a good um, romantic or sexual relationship. It's just kind of like, oh, I have to sacrifice my own desires for the crew. So um, I think that it would have been even cooler if she got to be like Kirk and be like, I'm going to beam down and you're really hot, so I'm going to date you. <laughs> but, uh, but it was still pretty awesome. So yeah, that's actually all I've had, but yes. Uh, thanks. And does anyone have any questions or disagree with me or agree with me or other favorite moments or parts you hate about Star Trek or 